In a twinkling, the cat climbed up the tree. Hi, I'm Jack Howell. This is a continuation of a video on hand position and finger motion, The Wisdom of Robert Marcellus, linked in the description. In that video, I alluded to an even more important aspect of hand position, which is looking forward in music and choosing hand positions that anticipate as many correct notes as possible, thereby elim eliminating wrong ones. I've been thinking about this video for a while. A day or two ago, I was watching an episode of Modern Marvels here on YouTube. Uh, the topic was accuracy, and it covered all different kinds of activities, from archery to space flight, where the objective is to propel a thing in such a way as to hit another thing. One of the forms of accuracy was billiards, or pool, demonstrated by a nine ball champion. In a game of nine ball, after the break, the scattered object balls must be pocketed sequentially. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. No skipping about. The champ said a very interesting thing. He said that when he looked at the table after the break, he saw where the cue ball needed to be to pocket the nine ball and worked backwards from there. Where did the cue ball need to pocket the eight and how must he spin it to leave it in position on the nine and so on seven to eight, six to seven, all the way back to the one. He said he could see every shot on the table before he started at once, without really thinking about it. I thought, hey, there's my intro. That's exactly what I wanted to talk about. The accomplished clarinetist looks at a musical passage and before playing the first note, hears what it will sound like and feels in the hands what it will feel like, often without really thinking about it. Like a billiards player thinking eight or nine shots ahead and always leaving the cue ball in position to make the next shot as easy as possible, every note, every fingering on the clarinet should anticipate as many subsequent correct notes as possible. That's why I say, your fingers are your tools. Don't leave them where you last used them. Put them where you will need them next. Wait, you say, do, do we really need to think about this? Even if we do learn music one note at a time, won't we eventually get smooth and fast and play beautifully if we simply practice enough? My answer is, it depends. If you are already accomplished and can play, to, play Peter and the Wolf easily, you may not need to think about it because you have already do what I'm talking about, probably subconsciously. In the previous hand position video, we talked about cortical or top-down thought, uh, how that thought programs subcortical bottoms up thought. So if you already do this, you paid your dues at some point in the past, and this process of anticipation and preparation became subcortical. However, there is an excellent chance that at least some of your students do need to think about it, and if you find Peter and the Wolf difficult and scary, you are one of those students. If you'll permit me a brief rant, many young students today are overscheduled. They spend too little time practicing fundamentals, and they mostly play ensemble music that it requires fundamental skills that they have not yet developed. From elementary band to youth orchestra, I see it. Many conductors choose music that is simply too hard for 85% of the ensemble, being generous, and they take professional tempi, no matter how many mistakes that causes. This is an absolutely spectacular breeding ground for bad habits. So, <clears throat> unless they get competent and early private instruction, students learning to play an instrument in ensembles like these find that spewing mistakes at a fast tempo is preferable to playing correctly and beautifully at a manageable tempo. So, when they do practice, what gets programmed into the subcortex is the panicked effort of lunging from one note to the next, trying to stay with the group without necessarily knowing what that next note is. Students in this predicament are playing music the way most of us amateurs play pool. Please, let's just make this shot. Just try to make this shot. If we make it, 
then we'll worry about the next shot. Well, you, you say, okay, yeah, 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 but that's only beginners. Once someone reaches a certain level, they stop doing that. Not so. The more talented and hardworking the student, the further they can go learning and playing music one note at a time. You can tell these players because their fingers arrive at each note just in time. There's usually a lot of extraneous finger motion, and they have issues with rhythm. They aren't the best sight readers. While hard workers can play fairly difficult music in this way, it's playing perpetual catch-up. Only one late arrival or one wrong decision away from a mistake. Uh, I was a just-in-time player myself through high school, and I won lots of stuff. An all-Northwest and state solo competition and all the various community orchestra solo competitions. Uh, and I remember someone asking me how I played all this stuff from memory. And I said it was like a record was playing and I was the stylus. I just followed the groove. But I remember studying Firebird and Capriccio Espanol with Bill Jackson in college and struggling. And it wasn't until I watched his hands move as he demonstrated that I realized I was doing it wrong that I was struggling because my hands weren't anticipating the patterns and if I wanted to play anywhere close to his length level I needed to change. I, I compare this to constructing a musical passage like a bicycle chain. When it works, it works, but lose one link and you're down. What you want to do is to construct a musical passage like a brick wall. You can lose a brick and the wall still stands. I've given this advice to grad students. Okay, if you're still here, you want to know how to play a bulletproof Peter and the Wolf. And if you're disappointed that this isn't a 30-second hack, be encouraged that's a that it is a way of thinking that can bulletproof anything. We could just as easily be talking about Daphnis or Firebird. So, let's get the cat up the tree. I know some of you play Peter and the Wolf on B-flat, but I don't, so all named notes will refer to the A clarinet. Remember our principle. Don't leave your fingers where you last used them. Put them where you will need them next. We will be thinking in hand positions that contain several notes, what a jazz pianist would call grips. The most obvious time to grab a grip is during a rest. There are lots of rests in this solo. Use them. That goes for all rests in all music. If, during every single rest, for the rest of your career, you will finger the first note of the upcoming phrase, you'll never miss it. If you see and prepare the first interval, that's two notes you will never miss, and so on. Over the course of a career, it can add up. Another time to grab a grip is when your tongue touches the reed to articulate. Every silence, no matter how short, is an opportunity to position your hands to anticipate as many subsequent notes as possible, at least the next one. This is basically Daniel Bernard's method of staccato, and there's a video on that coming. So take these first two bars plus pickup. This is a basic C major scale hand position in the left hand. You've got a D, C, you've got a D, you've got an E and F. Uh, in the right hand, it's a C major arpeggio, except that your pinky, your right pinky is on the F sharp instead of the low E. So don't wait until it's time to play to take your position. Do so during the narration. Fingering the G, rest your pinky on the right hand F sharp so it will be ready to execute with perfect hand position and finger motion. Don't wait until it's time to play the F sharp and then go fetch it. Anticipate it from the beginning and you'll never miss it. So why on the right? Why not on the left? Because I believe it is more efficient to keep as many notes together on one hand as possible. We'll, we'll see that when we get to the grace notes. So that's the first two bars, one hand position. Already we are reducing the number of decisions we must make. Looking at the next two bars of the solo, we notice that each bar contains the same notes. The second bar simply has the chords inverted. One harmony change, one hand position shift per, per, per bar. On the first eighth rest, finger the D sharp 
under the right index finger. Feel the low F under the right pinky and the B natural under your middle finger. On the second eighth rest, finger the E, feeling the B flat in your right X finger and the G in your right one, two, three. The next bar is exactly the same hand positions, just starting on B natural, to which you snap on the first eighth rest. On the second rest, snap to the B flat, feeling the E under your left index finger and the G loaded in your right hand. Now, I'm not accusing anyone, but I have heard mistakes made in these two bars. And when something like that happens in a lesson, my first question is, that pattern, that group of notes you just missed, what is it? Missing notes is indicative of not seeing the forest for the trees, of looking at and playing one note at a time instead of looking ahead. If you play this passage, these two bars, one note at a time, that's six decisions per bar, that's 12 decisions. That's a lot of opportunities to miss. In motorcycling, we have a saying, it's not how fast you're going that makes you crash. It's how fast you're making decisions. Consciously, verbally, harmonically identifying a group of notes forces us to organize the information and reduce decisions. Now, at some point, music defies harmonic analysis, but with Prokofiev, that point is still some ways off. So as an example of, of what, how we do this, let's look at these two bars. The first beat of each bar, and you would actually need to look at the score for this, the first beat of each bar has a concert F pizzicato in the celli bass, which is an A flat on a clarinet. So if we put that note in our octave and respell our chord, we have F, A flat, C flat, E flat, or the jazzy F minor 7 flat 5 chord. The second beat of each bar has a B flat in the celli bass, which is D flat on the A clarinet. So if we do the same trick, we wind up with G, B flat, D flat, F flat, or just a straight diminished seventh chord. Now, is it possible to play this solo perfectly and musically without knowing this? Absolutely. However, if it is really important that you not miss notes, let's say it is a condition of employment. It's a good idea to have as many ways not to miss notes as possible. Harmonic understanding of this passage or any passage elevates your musical thinking. If you've read Gulliver's Travels by Jonathan Swift, think of Gulliver awaking in Lilliputia. He's immobilized by hundreds of ropes. Each rope is no thicker than a thread and he could have broken any of them easily, but there are so many ropes that he can't move. The more ways we can understand a musical passage, the less chance that it will somehow escape during performance. And maybe when you perform, you forget all this stuff. But isn't this a better way to program your subcortical computer than lunging from one note to the next, hoping not to make a mistake? As our, our chief operating officer has said, hope is not a strategy. Snapping instantly to a group of correct notes at every opportunity is a solid strategy for both practice and performance. So while we're using rests to our advantage, let's skip over the triplets and look at the grace notes. The mix of flats and double flats and naturals um, can be confusing if you just look at one note at a time, but a moment's examination shows that each beat is a dominant seventh chord in first inversion landing on the root. If you've played Behrman three, these are vocabulary. Immediately in the chord arrest, finger the D sharp. I know it's written E flat, but we're thinking B dominant seven. Feel the F sharp loaded in the D sharp. Feel the A key loaded in the F sharp. Play the A with your right hand down, including the right hand B key, and arrive emphatically on the B, moving only your left hand. It's like setting a row of dominoes. The instant you stop the sound for the eighth rest, snap into position for the F sharp group. Finger the A sharp with your right hand down. If you can get the C sharp key down, I think that's ideal, but I can't quite. I just get it in position. So whether you move just your right hand across the break or the right hand plus your pinky, you're there. And then the E and the F sharp are, are right under your fingers. 
This group often trips up players who try to move their fingers so that they arrive at each note just in time. But if you use the eighth rest to reset to the position of the hand position I just showed you, you'll never miss a note in this group. And that goes for all the other groups. Set your rows of dominoes, knock them down, divide and conquer. The next bar is exactly the same. You can figure out the C dominant seven on beat four. Used each rest to preset the entire next burst. Now, here's my fingering for the last group of grace notes. When choosing fingerings for passages like this, I prioritize pitch and quality for the most prominent note, which here is, of course, is the long F sharp. I want the most in tune and stable fingering for this note, which I find to be the long F sharp. Thumb register one, two on the left hand, one, two, three, E flat on the right hand. To get to it, I use whatever fingerings convey the greatest impression of ease. And considering the speed, I'm prepared to make some small sacrifice in pitch or timbre to, uh, to attain greater ease and security. Obviously, if the pitch is too far out, the impression of ease is ruined, so it's a balancing act. So here, I play the A sharp on the side, the C sharp as overblown F sharp, leaving the B flat key down, leave it down also for the E played under, with the throat A key, and there it is, the long F sharp's right under my fingers. Now, if you honestly prefer the middle finger F sharp or, or another F sharp, you'll, you'll find a different solution. That's just mine. So, now let's back up and look at the triplets, which causes generally the most commotion. Like all great composers, Prokofiev did innovative things with common materials. Once again, if we look at this one note at a time and allow ourselves to be confused by the alphabet soup of accidentals, and as my colleague Joe Rounds used to say, they don't call them accidentals for nothing, we can miss the fact that each beat is simply a broken diminished chord beginning on the third. Or, taking the third note of each triplet and the first notes of the next triplet, each group is a broken major chord beginning on the root. Or, maybe you actually hear tritones coupled to major thirds. I think that's a pattern you would only have encountered if you, in Marcel Moise's technical mastery for the virtuoso flutist. Number six, series A, fourth column. We'll have to talk about that book someday. Anyway, it, it doesn't really matter how you think about it. What is important is that you do think about it, that you see and hear a pattern that makes sense to you, and you don't try to learn the whole thing one note at a time. Chromatically rising broken chords is not a pattern we often play, but it is a pattern, and jazz players could play it in their sleep. If we play arpeggios, the vocabulary is already there. We just need to make the connections. Now, however you understand it, you will probably practice this passage slowly. While you do so, think hand position constantly. Make sure that in each fingering, you feel at least the next note, as though it were spring-loaded, and you snap across the interval to it, simultaneously spring-loading for the next note, and so on. Start the passage with the pinky on the C-sharp key. When you lift your right pinky from the F sharp, don't just let it hover or mosey over and hope it arrives in time for the A flat at the right time. Put that tool where you're going to need it next. As you lift from the F sharp, vector over to the A flat, so it's right there. The more notes you can feel loaded in your hand position, the more smooth, rhythmic, and secure your playing will be. Speaking of jazz players, Here's an approach Bill Jackson showed me when I was in college. Bill was a good jazz player, and he said when he played this solo, he thought of the passage in fours, like a bebop lick. Once you've learned the pattern, try it. I, I find that it works. It reduces the number of information chunks from seven to five. It seems to accelerate more smoothly. smoothly. And perhaps, if you've struggled with the solo in the past, it sidesteps previous issues that may have been ingrained when you played it in triplets. So now that we've determined what this passage is and have a strategy to learn it, let's talk about speed. 
Magicians have a rule. Never show the audience a trick you can't do. A simple trick executed flawlessly fools everybody, while a difficult trick executed poorly fools nobody. Sometimes the conductor has a say in this, but generally as a performer, you should play within yourself and appear to take risks without actually doing so. You probably noticed that I started the triplet slightly under tempo, but if you didn't, so much the better. If you start slightly under tempo, you can make more of an accelerando, and your final speed will then seem faster to the audience, most of whom, unlike now, will not be clarinetists. It's the oldest trick in the book. And to paraphrase Dirty Harry, you've got to know your limitations. I remember hearing a recording on the radio where the clarinetist played a particularly lazy, unconcerned cat. It was slow, but it was perfect. Now, you're probably not going to win an audition playing it that slowly, but it is part of stagecraft to preserve the illusion of unlimited speed. If you play something cleanly and beautifully, the audience has no idea how fast you could have played it. As soon as you play it too fast and screw it up, the illusion is ruined. That said, what I've been talking about with hand position is how you play fast, as well as accurately. Fast playing doesn't come from playing one note at a time like slow players, only faster. It comes from organizing information so that you have fewer decisions to make. So, practice for clarity and enjoy the speed that comes as you learn to trust your patterns and relax. So that's most of the licks. Um, we'll talk about the ending in a minute. Let's talk about overall tempo relationships and musical intention. There are four different tempo character sections in this solo. Nervoso, accelerando, precipitato, and finally, a tempo ritardando. Being strict with the tempo relationship, we would start uh, at the indicated half note equals 96, accelerate through the triplets to some faster tempo for the precipitato, precipitato, and then we would play the legato eighth note phrase at half note equals 96 and maintain, maintain that tempo until the last four notes. And here I, well, we'll get to that in a minute. Personally, I'm not that strict. If you can start at 96, accelerate to 120 for the grace notes, and you can play everything cleanly and musically, go right ahead. And it's a good audition strategy to practice until you can play that sort of tempo scheme just in case. But your first priority when playing a solo is to make you sound great. If you're playing this in an orchestra, the conductor may prefer or ask for a strict 96, 120, 96 tempo scheme. But in my experience, Conductors want the solo to sound good, too. They don't want a yard sale any more than you do. If you're playing an audition, it's up to you to deploy your skills to best advantage. There will be a tempo sweet spot for the precipitato grace notes, where it still sounds fast and springy, but allows time for the dominant seventh chords to ring clearly through the grace notes. I think it makes sense to take that tempo as your reference and start the excerpt a little slower than that while maintaining the nervoso energy and character. The musical gesture of the solo presented clearly and confidently is more important than a BPM number. Don't show the audience a trick you can't do. Now, maybe I would think that because I'm not a technical genius. But I've heard auditions where the player started this excerpt too fast and exploded, either in the triplets or in the grace notes. And I thought, why did they do that? So remember, make yourself sound great. If you play an excerpt beautifully and the committee asks you to play it again only faster, you're still in the game. You've already played it perfectly, so you have that confidence. However, if you start faster than you can play cleanly and musically, it's probably game over. It is unlikely that the, the committee will be interested in discovering what the tempo is that's slow enough for you to play it well. So, finally, like our cat, we have scrambled through the difficulties and we are perched on the high F sharp. Now what? 
Although the indication is a tempo and ritardando is not indicated until the last four eighth notes, I think that, having reached safety, the cat will gradually release the tension and energy of having climbed for its life, becoming as comfortable as possible on its branch. Actually, this seems to be Robert McGinnis's opinion as well, because the ritardando in the International Excerpt book is at the beginning of the second bar of the phrase, while in the score and in the part it is two beats later. Leaving the F sharp, I like to relax the starting tempo very slightly rather than returning rigidly to it and strictly maintaining it. I also think, this is just me, that the subido piano following the F sharp can be taken with a grain of salt, that it is musical to settle into the softer dynamic rather than to drop suddenly, and to preserve enough volume in the piano to shape the descending phrase. This last phrase is where you stick the landing and leave your final impression. Of course, it's only a descending chromatic scale, but as I tell my students, pick all the low-hanging fruit. Play the half steps with as pure a legato as possible. Remember Tabuto's singing interval throughout, especially from the D-flat up to the E. I think the second register left hand is where the clarinet sounds most beautiful, and that's where you finish. So pour it on, finish the solo with maximum tone in the diminuendo. My final point is not advice. I'm not saying you should do what I do, I'm just telling you why I do it. My broad policy in music is, first, give it a chance to speak for itself. As Marcel Moise said, do not put your caca in the musique. However, I've always struggled to find feline nature in the cat's theme. The wolf's music is suitably ominous, the grandfather is low and gruff, the bird is flighty and chirpy, but I'm not sure that anyone listening to the music for the first time without narration would hear the bouncy low register clarinet and think, hey, there's a cat. It would be a pretty goofy cat. So. And I would never do this in the first round of an audition, and when I've played it with orchestras, I have always discussed it with the conductor first. I make the cat meow at the end. Adding a glissando is something I would normally consider disrespectful to the composer, and maybe Prokofiev would hate it. But kids recognize the meow and they laugh, and I think that helping kids hear ideas in music is the whole point of Peter and the Wolf. Now, if you're thinking, you'll see that this isn't just about Peter and the Wolf. Like the nine ball champion running the table, organizing information and anticipating neuromuscular sequences is how musicians play difficult music, whether they realize it or not. If you liked this video, please do me a solid and hit those like and subscribe buttons. All hail the algorithm. And if you're interested in music at Duquesne University or Carnegie Mellon University, you can contact me by going to duq.edu or cmu.edu and searching on my name. Go get them.